It's a little weird for me being on this side of a guitar today. It's been a little while, but uh, it's good to see you, man. We're glad you're here this morning, and um, I'm excited for what we're going to do today. We're in the sixth week of our series, and we've been going through the book of Romans for a while now and just picking some highlights from the book of Romans and studying our way through that stuff, and so we're going to continue that today, but before we get into that, let me catch you up a little bit in case... It's your first time checking us out or if you missed a little bit along the way, just so you know where we're gonna be today. So Romans was a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome. Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire. It was really kind of the center of the world in Paul's day. It was one of the largest, most influential cities in the world. And, and the Christians there were all pretty new Christians. And so if you knew anything, if you, if you took Western Civ in high school or college, if you know anything about history, you know that Rome wasn't an easy place to be a Christian. It was dangerous. There was a lot of persecution of Christians that happened in Rome. A lot of Christians were killed in Rome. And so it was a dangerous place to be a follower of Jesus. It also wasn't easy because Rome was a largely pagan city. And so there were temptations everywhere. There were all these distractions and all these things that were pulling on the Christians in Rome and, and kind of trying to pull them away from their focus on following Jesus. And honestly, probably not a lot unlike being a Christian in the world today. And so Paul wrote this letter to the Romans to encourage them to stay faithful. We're calling this series Tug of War because just like the Christians in Rome would have experienced and just like you and I experienced today, there's this tension, right? This tension between there's, there's my, human, my humanity, my sinful nature, there's like the me part of me that like wants to do things my way and I wanna live my way and I wanna do the things I wanna do and so that's like pulling me this direction but then on the other side, there's, there's Jesus and there's like, my, my, like the Holy Spirit and, and the, the Christian side of me, right? And there's this tension between what do I do? And, and it's like a tug of war that we're caught in the middle of. That's what the Christians in Rome would have been experiencing, and that's why Paul wrote this letter to them, because he wanted to encourage them to stay faithful. And so if you have a Bible with you this morning, open up to Romans chapter 12, and while you're on the way there, I wanna read you a couple verses from Romans chapter one, because these verses really summarize well what the book of Romans, what the, this letter that Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome kind of summarizes the theme of the book, okay? So this is Romans chapter one, verses 16 and 17. It says this, Paul wrote, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentiles. So this is Jesus for all people right here, okay? Paul says this gospel's for everybody. He says, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, and just as it's written, and catch this part, because this is what we're gonna unpack later in Romans chapter 12 here in just a few minutes, okay? This is it. The righteous will live by faith. faith. Try that again. The righteous will live by faith. faith. Correct, okay. So, in the first half of this letter to the Romans, Paul paints a picture of the need for Jesus. And so he talks about sin, and he talks about the consequence of sin. He talks about hopelessness and distance from God. And he talks about death. He uses words like, when we were still the enemy, God sent Jesus to die for us, right? He talks about the need for grace. But then, then he starts to introduce Jesus. And he talks about grace. And he talks about mercy. And he talks about what happens when Jesus goes to the cross and dies in our place. He's our sacrifice and he changes everything. That's, that's the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. Paul gets into all that stuff and he explains what the gospel means, Right, But then in chapter 12, where we're gonna start today, he shifts gears a little bit. He's been talking about what the gospel means. Now he's gonna start to talk about how we should respond because of it. In other words, when you understand, when you wrap your head a little bit around or you get a picture of what Jesus did for you on the cross, how should your life look different? Or how should you live differently because of that? How, how should you respond or what should you do? So he's talked about what the gospel means. Now he's talking about what, what we should look like, what our lives should look like because of that, okay? And Paul was somebody who understood this. He understood grace because Paul was a guy who lived with a lot of guilt and a lot of shame because of the life that he lived before he was a Christian. 
If you know anything about Paul, he was a Roman religious leader. He was a very well-educated man, and Paul was part of a movement that tried to stamp out Christianity because they were trying to protect and hold on to the power that they held as the religious leaders of the day, and Jesus was a threat to that, and so anybody who followed him was a threat to that. So Paul and the people that were part of this movement with him tried to stamp out Christianity. He was responsible for putting a lot of people in jail who hadn't done anything wrong. And he was responsible for the deaths of a lot of Christians who hadn't done anything except for put their faith in Jesus, which was something that Paul eventually did himself. And so what he has to say on this subject today as we get into this is incredibly important because Paul was a product of the, the very thing we're going to talk about today. He, he went through it himself. And he was a guy who had this moment where he bumped into Jesus and everything changed. And so he, he begins to explain what that should look like for us because he's been through it and he can relate, okay? So this is incredibly important. So I'm gonna give you the setup, we're gonna do that, and then we're gonna dive in deep with these verses and, and do some practical stuff and talk about what it means for us today in the 21st century. So Romans chapter 12, starting in verse one, and here's what Paul writes. He starts this way, he says, therefore, and that word is important, okay? That word is important because what he's saying is, look, in these 11, remember, Romans was a letter, and just like you would write a letter, or just like you'd write an email or a message to somebody, a text, it wasn't broken down in chapters and verses and sections and all those things. It was just a letter. And so he's just spent all this time, he's written this really long letter to the Christians, to the church in Rome, explaining all these things. And now he's saying, look, guys, because of all of that, like because of grace, because of all these things I've been telling you about, therefore, because of all of that, he says, I urge you. Brothers and sisters, and that's important too, brothers and sisters, and here's the deal this morning. If you're in the room today and you're not a follower of Jesus, you get a choice. This wasn't written to you. This was written to Paul's brothers and sisters in Christ. And so if you're in the room today and you're not a follower of Jesus, you get to choose what to do with this. You can, you can decide to do this. You don't have to. But if you're a, a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus in the room this morning, you're on the hook for this. Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of everything he's done for you, because you understand that, like, in light of that, in light of the mercy of God that loved you and saved you and redeemed you, bought you, paid for your sin, in light of how much Jesus loves you and how much he's done for you, he says, I urge you to offer your bodies, not just your intellect, not just your intentions, not just your mind, right, not just uh, your, yourselves for, on Sundays for an hour, but he says to offer your entire body, your entire life as a living sacrifice. Well, that's kind of weird. See, we understand sacrifice metaphorically, but they would have understood it literally because they saw these bloody, gory animal sacrifices was just a part of their culture. It's what they did. But when you sacrifice something, it, it dies, right? It's not a living sacrifice, and so people at this point would have started to say, oh, what? Paul says, stick with me. He says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And then he says, this is your true and proper worship. And those words, true and proper, are actually translated from one Greek word. And the word is logikos. Anybody want to take a stab at what English word we get from that? Logical. Logical. And so what Paul says is, look, in view of God's mercy, in view of everything that he's done for you, because you understand it, the only logical thing for you to do is to respond by, by offering yourself as a sacrifice to him. It's the only thing that makes sense. He says it's true, it's proper, it's nothing else makes sense. It's just, it's logical, right? He says this is the thing to do. And so he must have known at that point that people would have been saying, well, well hold on a second, Paul, like I, I don't understand any of this, what do you mean? And so then he begins to unpack it, he begins to explain it. He says, look, don't think that killing an animal is gonna make things right with God anymore. Because it takes more than that. It's not about killing animals, it's about offering yourself. It's about saying, I'm gonna be a daily, a living, a minute by minute, watch me live for your glory and your honor kind of sacrifice. And then he goes on to explain how we do that in verse two. This is what he says. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Do not conform, do not be conformed. Don't allow yourself to be conformed to the pattern of this world. Because if you conform to the pattern of this world, you're just gonna look like everybody else. And you're just gonna live like everybody else. 
And you're just gonna have relationships like everybody else. And you're just gonna go to work like everybody else. You're gonna be a debt like so many people. Your life is just gonna look like everybody else and you're just gonna go with the flow of culture. And so he says to these Christians, look, don't allow yourself to be conformed to that pattern because God has something so much better for you. He has something so much more important and more significant for you. And then he gives us this contrast. He says, but be transformed. Be transformed. He says, don't allow yourself to be conformed. Do you know how much intentionality it takes to be conformed? Zero. You just wake up and you go through the motions and before long, your life just looks like everybody else around you, right? It takes no intentionality. It takes no discipline. It takes no self-control. But Paul says, I want you to be different because Jesus wants you to be different. And so he says, I want you to lean in and I want you to decide and I want you to give it some effort. And I want you to make a decision to be transformed. He says, don't conform, be transformed. And then he says, you want me to tell you how? And he goes on and he says, by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. He says, I want you to present your body as a living sacrifice. But in order for your bodies to do the kind of things that living sacrifices have to do, some changes have to happen in the way that you think. And you're transformed not simply by the engagement of your will. It's not just enough to want to, okay? You're transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, to renew means to restore. And so maybe this will help you process this, help you think about it another way. But I don't know if you've ever done this or seen a TV show where they do this. Anybody ever seen the process for restoring a piece of furniture? You ever seen that before? How about this? Anybody ever seen the process for restoring the finish or the paint job on a car? You ever seen anybody do that or maybe you've done that before? Okay, so if you're gonna restore a piece of furniture, you're gonna restore the finish on a car or something like that, before you can put on the new, what do you have to do? You gotta take off the old. So you, so you go through this process of like sanding and, and removing by, you know, just different steps and it's this long process and it takes a lot of time and it's really tedious and unless, uh, maybe it's your thing and you're just weird, but it's boring, okay? If that's your thing, I would love to have you wax my car, okay? But for most of us, it's boring. It just takes time, and it's not something we wanna do. But let me ask you this question. What happens if you skip that step? What happens if you just put on the new? The old just peels right off, right? If you don't go through the process of taking off the old, then the new just peels right off. And honestly, that exact reason is why some of us have had these moments where we've made these commitments, where we made these promises to God, like, God, my next time's gonna be better. My next job, I'm gonna do better. My next relationship, I'm gonna do better. My next marriage, I'm gonna do better. My next semester at school, I'm gonna study harder. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. And then the new just peels right off because you are never really transformed and your mind was never really renewed, and you never really took off the old before you put on the new. And do you know why we aren't better at this? We're not better at this because renewal takes time. And things that take time are not things that we like. We live in a culture that, that lives for instant gratification, right? We don't want things that take time, we want things that happen now. I don't wanna wait for something, I want it now. I don't wanna wait to be something, I wanna be that thing now. We live for instant gratification and renewal takes time. Renewing your mind takes time. But if you don't take time to take off the old, the new just peels right off. So Paul says right here in these verses, if you wanna be transformed, it's not just a matter of the will and it's not simply a matter of discipline. It takes renewing your mind. And this is a big deal. So let me give you some examples. Several times a year, I'm asked to, to officiate a wedding ceremony, to marry a couple and I don't have a lot of rules for how I do that, but one of the only rules I have is that I won't marry somebody if they've been divorced for less than two years. Why? Because you need time to renew your mind. You need time to take off the old. You need time to let Jesus work on your life, work in your heart, and, and honestly, to be ready for that new, that new marriage, that new relationship, it takes time. For serial daters who just go relationship to relationship to relationship. I used to work with high schoolers and college students that I'd see in these cycles, even, even early teens, right? And it's like, you go from relationship to relationship and, and, and that you just feel empty. And I'd say, well, hold on, just hit the positive. Just take some time because you need time to renew your mind. And you're like, what if I meet the right person? And it's like, they're not gonna like you because you're not ready yet because you're not the right person. 
It takes time to renew your mind, right? If you go through a big traumatic experience in your life, you, you lose a loved one, or you lose a job, or, or, or your career you know, shifts and you didn't see it, or it could be something good. It could be you get a new job, or you get a big raise, whatever it is. If you go through something significant or traumatic in some way in your life, don't make any big decisions for a while. Give yourself some time to, to take off the old, to adjust, to put on the new, to renew your mind, right? Don't, don't buy a car, don't buy a house, don't move, don't get married, don't do something like that. Just give yourself a little bit of time to renew your mind because it takes time. And you've been in the, you've been in the emergency room emotionally. You've been in the emergency room in terms of the things that are happening in your life and so you gotta give yourself time to adjust and time to catch up. It, it takes a while. And the apostle Paul nailed it, okay? He said, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then look at the promise. This is what gets us through, okay? This is what helps us be patient through this process. He says, then this is what will happen. He says, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. Then, like after, after you've taken some time, after you've said, okay, I'm not gonna conform, I'm not just gonna be like everybody else, I'm gonna take some time, I'm gonna let Jesus work in my life. Like after you've done that, and after you've allowed him to renew your mind, he says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is for you. And it's good, and it's pleasing, and it's perfect. So let me ask you a, a, a question this morning. If you're a Christian, let me ask you a question. Do you wanna know what God's will for you is? Do you wanna know? You ever had a moment, like a conversation with God that started like this, where you're just like, God, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? Maybe you came to him and it's like, God, what do you want from me? Like, I'm ready to do whatever you want me to do. Or maybe it's a frustrated thing where it's like, God, I've been trying and trying and doing things your way and nothing seems to work and I still feel empty and I'm still at square one. Or maybe it's like, God, I've prayed and I've prayed and I've waited and I've waited and I haven't heard a thing, so what do you want from me? What, what do you want from me? Have you ever had that moment? I'd be willing to bet that most, if not all of us, have had that experience at some time. And the comforting thing for you to know this morning is you're not alone. You're not alone. I would wager that anybody who's followed Jesus for five minutes has had that moment. And maybe some people who haven't even ever decided to follow Jesus, you've had that point where it's just like, God, what do you want from me? What, what, what's going on? There's an encounter in Luke chapter 18. Jesus meets this guy, has this interaction with somebody who asked him this very question. Now I know that some of you have heard this story a hundred times before, so don't tune me out here because I'm gonna get to a point with this, okay? But if you've heard this story, hang with me. Here's what happens, Luke chapter 18. It says, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, a couple important things from this, this first part of this passage. When this, this leader calls Jesus good teacher, that's significant. I wanna tell you why. It's significant because historians tell us, and, and this, this verse alludes to the fact that this guy would have been a religious leader of some kind or a significant leader in the community. And, and so it was really uncool for religious leaders to ever approach Jesus with any kind of respect or give him any kind of, of respect or treat him as an authority in any way. And so for this man to approach Jesus and say, good teacher, he's literally saying, hey, I think the things you teach are good. And Jesus was a guy who by this point was saying, I'm God. And so this guy's saying, okay, I can get on board with that. So it's significant when he calls him good teacher, and you see a little bit of that in Jesus' response later in this verse. The other significant thing from this is, I want you to miss this, okay? This guy, it's not like Jesus is sitting alone on a park bench, and this guy walks up and starts to talk to him. There's a crowd, and this guy's been in the crowd for a few minutes. And so he's been watching Jesus teach, and he's been seeing him interact with people, and he's seen him heal people, and he's seen miracles by now. And so when he approaches Jesus, just a few minutes before, he heard Jesus tell this story about a tax collector who was justified before God because he was humble. He was justified before God because of his humility. And then uh, uh, right after that, he sees Jesus interact with this group of these, these rowdy, noisy, crazy kids, and the disciples try to turn them all away, but Jesus says, no, let them come here, let them come here, that's fine. And then he tells all the people, look, if you wanna receive the kingdom of heaven, you gotta have the faith just like one of these kids. You gotta be, you gotta be open and trusting and, and you gotta be just like them. And so when this young ruler, when this man comes to Jesus, he comes to him, he's not saying, hey, what do I have to do to get eternal life? He's saying, Jesus, what do I have to do? Because I've, I've heard you say what a tax collector needs to do and I've, I've, I've heard you talk about the kids and I've seen it, but, but what do you want from me? God, what do you want from me? That's what he's saying. 
Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' answer here is interesting. He says, why do you call me good? And I imagine Jesus says this with a smile on his face because he understands that when the man called him good teacher, he knows what he's saying there. He says, no one is good except God alone. You know that, right? He says, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. And he says, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Jesus, I got all that figured out. I got all that locked down. Not a problem. I don't know if this man came to Jesus just looking for a thumbs up and an attaboy, like you're doing a great job, but Jesus is about to make a point, all right? Jesus referenced five commandments in his answer from the 10 commandments in the Old Testament, and he specifically mentioned the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, the ninth commandment. Those are the ones that deal with our relationships with people. And so what we learned from this, because of this man's response, is it seems like at least in his own opinion, when it comes to his relationships with people, his horizontal relationships, like me and you, interpersonal relationships, he's pretty solid. He's doing okay. He says, I've kept all these things since I was a boy. No problem. So I'm good, right? And this is Jesus' answer to him. In verse 22, Jesus says, it says when he heard this, Jesus said, you still lack one thing. And so I think the man kind of leans in. Jesus says, sell everything you have and give to the poor, come and follow me, and then you will have treasure in heaven. When he heard this, the man became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looks at him and he says, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Is it, I, he said, indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So what does this have to do with renewing your mind? Let me tell you how this connects. This man's problem wasn't his money, not at the root, okay? His problem wasn't his money because money isn't evil. Despite what you may have heard, money is not evil. The Bible says the love of money is evil. And so this man's problem wasn't his stuff because it's not sinful to be wealthy and it's not wrong to have possessions. The problem becomes when something takes the place of Jesus in your life. And when your identity and your security begin to be found in anything other than him, it, it's an issue, it's a problem, and that's what this man's problem was. And so when he came to Jesus and he said, hey, what do, what do I have to do? What do you need, what do you want from me, Jesus? And Jesus says, you need to renew your mind. You gotta change your way of thinking. You gotta release your hold on your stuff. You gotta release your hold on your money and your, your possessions because they're, they've become your identity. And Jesus says, you gotta let go of that and you gotta come and follow me. It's a complete change of thinking for this guy and he couldn't do it. So do you wanna know what God's will for your life is? And some of you are like, yes, I've been praying that God would tell me what his will for my life is. Paul says you gotta take some time to renew your mind. Let me tell you something. That's why you should be reading your Bible every day. And some of you are like, I don't understand it. It's okay, read it anyway. You took like geometry, right? Do you understand that? Some of you are like, I don't believe it. It's okay, you read stuff you don't believe all the time. Where are you Lord of the Rings fans at? Come on. You gotta, be, you gotta be reading your Bible. You gotta get into the word of God because that's when your mind starts to change. That's where the change starts to happen. And, and here's the reason why this is so important. And this is, this is what I want you to take home with you today, okay? This is why it's important. Because if you think the way you used to think, you're simply gonna do the things that you've always done. If you think the way you used to think, you're simply gonna do what you've always done. And until there's a change in your thinking, there will never be a lasting change in your actions, right? Until there's a change in your thinking, there will never be a lasting change in your actions. So here's what we're gonna do. Uh, that's, that's the setup, okay? But I'm not gonna leave you hanging there because I know this is a big concept. It's a little bit heady. It's a little intimidating. It's hard. So we're gonna talk about this in some really practical ways. And I wanna give you four things. I call these four lethal assumptions. And for one of you, honestly, there's probably only gonna be one of these that feels like a speed bump. For some of you, you're gonna be going, and there's three of those that just kick my butt. For some of you, you're like, none of those are a problem, okay? I don't, none of those are my assumptions or my beliefs about life, and that's okay. 
But I just wanna try to surface some things for some of us this morning about the way that we believe, that maybe you didn't even know you believe these things, and I just, it's, it's kinda like an operating system for your life that just keeps kicking out these behaviors, and you wind up doing things, and you're like, what was I thinking, right? You have that moment where it's like, what was I thinking? So I want you to understand a little bit about what you're thinking so you can start to change your way of thinking. So four lethal assumptions, we'll go through these, and hopefully it'll connect a little bit for you personally, okay? So here we go, number one. If I find the right person, everything will be all right. If I find the right person, everything will be all right. Eh, wrong. Wrong. If you become the right person. See, it's not about finding the right person, okay? It's you, you think your last relationship didn't work out because you dated an idiot. And you're like, if I just found a non-idiot, then it'd be better. But you know what the problem is? You gotta ask yourself this question, why did I date an idiot? And you don't know, because you don't know what you're thinking, so if something doesn't change, you're gonna date another idiot. You gotta change your way of thinking, you gotta change your, your, your way of thinking, and it, it, it's gotta be a renewing of your mind. So what was it about him or her that was so appealing or so attractive that you found yourself in a relationship and you wound up with regret? You have to answer that question. I want you to take this with you, okay? The goal is becoming the right person, not finding the right person. The goal is becoming the right person. If you become the, this is, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, I stole this from somebody, um, so this is not original, but it's so good. If you become the person that the person you're looking for is looking for, then chances are you'll find them. If you become the person that the person you're looking for is looking for, then chances are you'll recognize them when you see them, but not until you become them, because right now, if you met them, they're not gonna like you. Okay, you're, you're not ready for that, so spend some time becoming the person that the person you're looking for is looking for. I promise that actually makes sense. If you say it to yourself about 100 times, you'll figure it out, all right? Being a living sacrifice means that we focus more on who God is shaping us to be than who we're chasing after to be with, okay? That's part of being a living sacrifice, all right? Number two, moving on. Second lethal assumption, my situation's unique. I, I see what the Bible says. Like, I've, I've learned this stuff. I've, maybe you, some of you have been taught something your whole life, and you're like, I get that. I don't know what it means, but my situation is unique. You don't understand. It's different, right? No, it's not. Do you know why when you go to a doctor, most of the time they can diagnose what's wrong with you? Because bodies are pretty much the same. And, and I hate to tell you, but, like, you're unique. Like, yeah, you're one of a kind. That's cool. It makes you feel good, right? Your situation is not unique, it's just not. And, and this is why this is such a dangerous assumption is because when you start telling yourself, hey, it's different for me, my situation's unique, then that's the way that you dodge the truth. And that's the way that you dodge wise counsel. It's the way that you dodge the rules or the part of the rules, you know, if you wanna use that word, that you don't like. You say, it's different, you don't understand. My situation's different, it's unique. It's, it's just not. Being a living sacrifice means that you stop making excuses and you start living from God's truth. It means you stop making excuses for how you want to live, and you just start living the way that you know that you should, okay? That's, that's being a living sacrifice. Number three, it's not right, but it makes me happy, and God wants me to be happy. <laughs> what in the world do you base that on? Well, I want me to be happy, right? And, and that's really all I've got. I want me to be happy, and, and God wants me to be happy because he loves me, he wants me to be happy, right? Like, this is a really popular way of thinking right now, but, but you know this, if it's not right, things are never gonna turn out right. Because if it's not right, it must be wrong, wrong, right? So what was I thinking? What you were thinking was, even though it's not exactly legal, or even though it's not exactly ethical, or even though it's not exactly something that you should do, you're like, but my situation's unique, right? Remember that? And so when you find yourself going, well, it's not exactly right, you should just hit the pause button right there because that's a major red flag. And what you're about to do is give yourself permission or talk yourself into doing a wrong thing because you're believing that God wants you to be happy. Let's just assume God wants you to be happy. He does. Jesus wants you to be happy because he loves you. But he loves you so much that his desire for your life will always be that you grow and you mature and you continually embrace a better, healthier way of living. He doesn't want you to stay where you are, okay? He does love you and he does want you to be happy, but not at the sacrifice of living according to his plan. 
That's his truth. And so you gotta, you gotta have that renewing of your mind and, and he wants you to, in that process to repent and to walk away from your old ambitions and your old desires and your old way of living and leave that stuff behind. And then here's the key. The key is you can't go back. You can't go back. I don't know if you, if you remember this from history class, but in the year 1619, there's this fleet of these Spanish ships that set sail for the New World. Maybe you remember the name Cortez. Right, so he leads this group of, of sailors across the, the Atlantic Ocean to the New World, and they land in Mexico. And, and when he got there, he gave his crew kind of this crazy, insane command. Does anybody know what it was? What was it? Shout it out. Burn the ships. And his crew's like, are you nuts? He's like, no, light them on fire. And here's the reason why. It's because he knew that what they were about to start out into together was gonna be the hardest thing they'd ever done. And he didn't want this temptation in the back of their minds when things got difficult that, hey, we can just jump on the boat, pull up anchor, and head back where we came from. He, he was saying, hey, guys, burn the ships, it's do or die. And when you commit to Jesus, you gotta burn the ships. You can't live your life with this temptation of, I can just, I can just uproot, go back to my old way of doing things. You gotta, you gotta stop flirting with that temptation. You gotta stop leaving that. You gotta slam the door shut. And you gotta be all in with your commitment to Jesus. It's huge. Being a living sacrifice means that you lay your ambitions and your desires on the altar and you chase after God everything that you have. And then here's the fourth thing. This last one is big because this is at the heart of all of them. If I only had, fill in the blank, then I would be satisfied. If I only had more money, if I only had a better job, if I only had better marriage, kids, or a nicer car, a nicer house, or more, more clothes, whatever, fill in the blank. If I only had something, then I'd be more happy. Let me ask you a question. Do you know anybody that has only one tattoo? And some of you are like, well, I do. Well, for now. <laughs> that's just one example. I don't have any problem with tattoos. I have one. It's okay. Like, whatever. But, but that's just an example. Appetites. When it comes to appetites, you got to understand this. Appetites are never fully and finally satisfied. They're just not. And so the whole idea of if I just had this thing, then I'd be happy. If I just had this, then I'd be satisfied. That's a lie. So hey, go ahead and buy it. Go ahead and lease it. Go ahead and rent it. But don't do it because you convinced yourself, because you, you talked yourself into it based on this lie, this idea that if I just had this thing, then I'd be satisfied because it's just not true. And you'll wind up in this place where you're going, what was I thinking? And in fact, as you were thinking that somehow owning it or renting it or leasing it or buying it or wearing it or hanging it on your wall or dating it or driving it or whatever was gonna make you happy. And it just won't. It just won't, that's a lie. So just keep that front and center before you make another decision. Because just like the rich young man in Luke chapter 18 in the story that we read earlier, every one of us has something in our life that we hold on to with a tight grip. There's something that we hold on to and we're tight-fisted about it. We won't let that thing go. And we'll say to Jesus, you can have every part of my life, you do whatever you want with everything else, but this thing's mine, so keep your hands off right? We each have that thing that it's so hard for us to let go of. Some things are easy, and what's easy for you to let go of might be hard for me to let go of, but some of us have easy stuff, and some of us have that thing that we're like, Jesus, you can't have this. This is mine, and we're, we're, we're relentless about it, okay? We have that thing that we hold tight-fisted, but here's the truth. The truth is you're not truly a living sacrifice until you've opened your grip on that thing, because your hands, you can't take hold of what God has for you in your life if your hands are already full of your stuff. You can't take hold of God's purpose for your life if your hands are already full of your own. You, you can't do that, it doesn't work that way. And then you'll have this moment where eventually you'll bump into Jesus and, and you're at the end of your rope and you'll say, what do you want from me, Jesus? Because I've been doing everything your way and I've been trying it your way and nothing seems to be working and I just feel empty and I'm stuck at square one and it's, I just, it's, nothing's making sense and he's gonna say, you gotta let go of that thing. You gotta release that thing, you gotta let that go and then come and follow me and you won't be able to do it because you've been holding on to it for so long. And so you gotta release your grip on that thing. Let me ask you this. Can you imagine what your life would be like if you stopped chasing carrots 
And if you stop making excuses and if you stop looking for the next fix or the next relationship or the next job or the next person that you needed to make you happy and you finally just, you just <sighs> exhale and say, Jesus, I'm willing to try it your way. I'm willing to give it a shot. And you say, well, Jimmy, how can I do this? Because you already said it's, it's so hard to do. It's nearly impossible and I've tried a bunch of times and it's just not working. And, and listen, I'm not saying it's easy. It's not easy at all. If it were easy, you wouldn't have to show up here on Sunday morning and study verses like these. In fact, if it were easy, Paul wouldn't have wrote these verses in the first place. It's not easy, it is the hardest thing you will ever do. We're talking about the things that you hold closest and dearest in your life, and some of these things are seemingly good things. They're seemingly, let me give you a personal example, okay? Three months ago, my wife and I had a little baby girl, I think, she, here she is. She's sleeping right now. I'm probably gonna make her mad when I pick her up. She's pretty comfortable. Oh yeah, there we go. It's okay. Shh, it's okay. There we go. So this is Ellie. She's three months old. She's probably real mad at me. I always heard people say that you wouldn't know what love is until you held your own child in your hands for the first time. And I'm not gonna say I didn't believe them, I just didn't really understand it until I held her for the first time. And I do love her. I would die for her. And listen, church, I love you, but if one of you came up here this morning and you tried to hurt her, or you tried to take her from me, I would do whatever it takes to stop you. She's mine, right? Now, I'm gonna get real transparent for a minute. Some of you who know me know that two years ago, my best friend died from lung cancer, 33 years old. And he left his wife and his two young boys behind. And there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about him. And then, now that I have a little girl of my own, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about what it must have been like for him to go through that, the treatments and the doctor's appointments and, and to be wrestling this whole time with this idea that I might not be there to watch my boys grow up. I might not be there to watch them play basketball. He was a basketball player. I might not be there to, to see that. Who's gonna raise my kids? Who's gonna teach them to follow Jesus? Who's gonna teach them to treat women right? Who's, who's gonna teach them to be godly men? And now that I have a little girl on my own, there's not a day that I don't think about, what if that happened to me? And so let me tell you something that started to happen to me three months ago. Three months ago, I started to lose sleep. I started to lay awake at night, I lay in bed. My wife's asleep and I'm just staring at the ceiling because I was terrified. What would I do? What would I do? And what I was doing was I'm, I'm treating her, I'm treating my family, I'm, I'm treating them like they're mine. And, and listen, family's not, it's, it's not a bad thing, but I'm treating them like they're mine and, and I'm trusting myself more than I'm trusting God. And what God started to do is he started to break that in me a little bit. And he's, I think that's how he taught me something because what he started to tell me is, Jimmy, you can't, you can't do that because they're not yours. He, he, he said, Jimmy, they're not yours, they're mine. And you gotta trust me. And so I'm gonna give her back to my wife before she has a meltdown. Hang on a second. We did really good right there. <laughs> that, that worked out well. So listen. I don't know what it is in your life. It could be your career, it could be your family, it could be an addiction, it could be your sexuality, it could be your money and your stuff, your possession, it could be a good thing, it could be a, a toxic thing, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is that you're holding and your grip is like this, and what you've told yourself is if I just had this thing, I'd be okay. But some of you this morning, you're holding on to that thing and you know you're not okay. 
And what, what Paul is saying in these verses in Romans, what Jesus wants you to hear is, is you've got to renew your mind. And that process is saying, and this, this is what I've had to do every night as a father, is I've had to pray this prayer and I've had to say, God, would you give me the faith to trust you that if something happens to me, my little girl's okay. And I'm okay. My wife's okay. Our family's okay. Like, God, would you give me the faith that whatever you do, I will follow you. And I'm telling you, whatever you're holding in your hand, it starts with that prayer. It starts with saying, God, would you give me the faith that whatever you choose to do, I will follow you. And I can let go of that thing because I trust you more than I trust me. In just a minute, we're gonna take communion together. So servers, if you wanna go ahead and get ready and, and start passing the trays. And, and here's what I want you to do this morning. As they do this, I want it, therefore, let me urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of everything that he's done for you, in view of how much he loves you, in view of the fact that he gave his life for you, I wanna urge you this morning, would you offer yourself as a sacrifice to him? And whatever you're holding on to, would you just, would you pray? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that in the next three minutes you gotta let go because some of you have been holding on to that thing for a lifetime. It's not that easy. But would you just pray, God, would you give me the faith to trust you, to start to let go? And be transformed by the renewing of your mind and then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is for your life. Here's the beautiful thing. I told you how much I love my daughter. One thing I can't imagine is if somebody came up to me and said that I had to, I had to let her go and, and she had to die for you. I'm gonna be honest, my answer would be no. But that is what Jesus did. That's what, that's what God, he was, God was so open-handed with you and me that he gave his son to die for you and for me. And in this moment, in this, as we're taking communion together and as we're thinking about these verses and as we're praying through the idea of transformation and as we're thinking about what it looks like to surrender things in our lives to God, would you just let that be on your mind? Would you just let that be in your heart, this idea that, okay, God, you were that open-handed with me and you were that, you, you were that loving and you were that giving and you were that, that, that sacrificially generous with me. And God, would you, just, would you give me the faith to be that way with you? It's possible for one reason. If you remember back in Luke 18, when the rich young ruler walks away from Jesus and the people who are still standing there, they, they kind of said, so, so what do we do with that? You know, then, and Jesus said, I tell you the truth, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And the only way this transformation and this renewal is possible is because of what Jesus did on the cross for you. And that's why we have this moment. And so in just a second, I'm gonna pray for you and I will give you a minute to take communion and, and to think about that. And, and again, just I, maybe use this moment to say thanks, maybe use this moment to pray for faith, maybe use this moment just to reflect on the fact that he loved you that much. But, but the transformation is possible because of what he did for you on the cross, because he loves you that much, he cares for you that much, that he was even willing to die for you. It's incredible. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for what you did for us on the cross. And God, going, looking at the book of Romans and thinking about sin and thinking about death and thinking about hopelessness and thinking about despair, it is unreal, the fact that we don't, we don't have to live in that. We can live with hope and we can live with joy uh, because we can look forward to eternal life with you. God, we give you thanks for that today. Would you give us the faith to release our grip on the things that we hold close, God, on the things that even seemingly good things, but the things that hold your place in our life. And would you help us to trust you that wherever you call us and wherever you lead, we'll go because we know that you're faithful and you're good, God, and you're in control. Thank you so much for Jesus. We pray all this in his name, amen.